uh, session. Um, uh, I would like to introduce Catherine Pierce Linzuli. And it's going to take me a minute to read all this because she has accomplished so much in four years. The clicker is right there. Uh, Catherine is graduating with a degree in biology with a concentration in medical sciences. She is from Oviedo, Florida. She has been at SCU for four years, four long years. Um, she has served as the SC, SCMDA president, a TA, side peer manager, SCU house groups leader, health service student worker, was part of honors. She plans to attend Barry University and St. Petersburg, Florida to become a future physician's assistant. Hello everyone, my name is Katie Pearson Dooley and today I would love to talk to you all about the consequences of early life stress and the impact of bioinflammatory marker TNF-alpha on susceptibility to cardiovascular disease in mice. Before I really dive in, I wanna quickly clarify, I mentioned I'm going to be talking about early life stress in mice. However, the true rationale of the story is focused on adverse childhood experiences in humans, but of course we never refer to mice as children. So for the sake of this study, the terms adverse childhood experiences and early life stress will be used interchangeably. So what is adverse childhood experiences? Essentially, they're an array of different categories of childhood traumas, things like childhood abuse, childhood neglect, or even a child living within a dysfunctional household. And in 1998, a key study was published that identified that the more of these different categories of adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, that an individual had experienced, the more likely they were to develop an array of different chronic diseases later in life. So much so that they found that an individual with four or more of these adverse childhood experiences was three times more likely to develop cardiovascular disease or lung disease compared to an individual with zero of these adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Additionally, a study done in the United States later with over 200,000 respondents found that up to 61% of the respondents had at least one of these ACEs and up to 25% of them had at least three or more. So clearly there's prevalence in society of these adverse childhood experiences occurring and before I continue, I want to emphasize that despite this prevalence, it seems that there's a lack of conversation surrounding the topic amongst healthcare providers currently. And so my true hope with this research is that we can identify the scientific physiological basis behind potentially how these childhood experiences are leading to these increased likelihoods of developing disease states, so that we can better encourage our healthcare providers to have these kinds of conversations with their patients. So what do we know currently about trauma's physiological impact on the body? Well, let's start with a healthy body under acute stress to ask this question. So under acute short-term stress, the healthy body regulates itself using what we know as the HPA axis, or a connection between the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal glands. Now what happens under short-term stress is this HPA axis gets activated and cortisol, which is a common stress hormone, gets released. When cortisol levels increase, it decreases the levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines that are floating throughout the body. And now it does this because the body's essentially saying, okay, we're under a short-term attack. Something's attacking us right now. We need to shut down anything that's not needed or necessary so that we can be the most prepared to fight or flight whatever is attacking us in this moment. However, when this occurs repetitively, so the body's under constant stress, those cortisol levels are constantly elevated and the body just gets used to its presence being there. And so when the body gets used to it, it stops responding to it as well. And so there's nothing limiting those pro-inflammatory cytokines anymore. And so we see a huge increase in these pro-inflammatory cytokines, as well as systemic chronic inflammation, so inflammation throughout the entire body. Now, this is incredibly important because what we've seen in recent decades of research is a correlation to the similar diseases that we've seen correlate to ACEs be present in those with systemic chronic inflammation. So let's go back really quickly. We mentioned that adverse childhood experiences and more of them lead to an increase in likelihood of developing these different disease states. We've also seen that when the body is under chronic stress, so repeated incidents of different childhood traumas potentially, that there is a dysregulation of cortisol and therefore an increase in the pro-inflammatory cytokines that are floating throughout the body. So my question is, could the potential link that could help us explain how these adverse childhood experiences are leading to increased likelihoods of developing diseases later in life 
be linked to these pro-inflammatory cytokines. In order to investigate that, we're going to look at cardiovascular disease and TNF-alpha. Why cardiovascular disease? Well, cardiovascular disease remains the number one underlying cause of death in the United States today. It is also has one of the greatest correlations to adverse childhood experiences out of that list that I mentioned previously. And now why TNF-alpha? Well, TNF-alpha, also known as tumor necrosis factor alpha, is one of those pro-inflammatory cytokines that cortisol usually limits that I mentioned previously. And specifically important with TNF-alpha is that in human studies, we found that TNF-alpha is the most drastically elevated inflammatory biomarker in humans with childhood trauma. Additionally, TNF-alpha has been correlated to cardiovascular disease previously, particularly in those with atherosclerosis. Now, atherosclerosis is pictured here, which is plaque buildup within an artery. And very interestingly as well, a study done on psoriasis patients, which is a dermatological disease, found that patients who were given TNF-alpha blockers as a part of their treatment for their psoriasis had 50% less incidence of heart attacks than patients who were just on their traditional topical treatments for psoriasis. So this, along with some other research, leads us to question, could TNF-alpha blockers be used as a preventative to cardiovascular disease susceptibility? Now, despite this thought, there is no current data on the role of TNF-alpha in cardiovascular disease susceptibility in those with childhood trauma. So that leads me into my first aim, which is to identify which inflammatory markers remain the most elevated in mice with a history of early life stress. Now, as I mentioned previously, we've seen that TNF-alpha is the most elevated in humans with a history of early life trauma. But because we're doing the study in mice, we first need to make sure that it is similarly correlative in mice. So my hypothesis is that we will see that TNF-alpha is the most elevated biomarker in mice for those who receive early life stress compared to those who are not exposed to early life stress. In order to test this, I will first obtain my mice. Now I'll be using male mice of the third generation. And this is important because we've seen that people who have a history of trauma over their lifetime can actually have effects on their offspring in the sense of their offspring may be affected by their trauma. And so in order to eliminate this as a variable as a whole, we're going to be using the third generation of mice obtained with the first two generations being controlled in very healthy, stable environments. Secondly, my mice will be split up into two groups, half of which will receive early life stress, the other half will not. And lastly, we will test the mice to see what pro-inflammatory biomarkers remain the most elevated at the end, specifically for those who receive the early life stress. In order to investigate um, cardio, in order to investigate early life stress in mice, so in order to replicate adverse childhood experiences in mice, we use what is known as the multiple hit model of early life stress. To do this, when the mice are 17 days old, they'll be exposed to early weaning and maternal separation. Basically, the mice are removed from their mom's presence, and that creates nutrient insecurity as well as frantic behaviors in the moms because they're not able to care for their pups. And this resembles neglect and household dysfunction as we would see in humans. Secondly, the mice will be exposed to electric foot shock, which resembles physical abuse and helplessness in the mice. And lastly, they'll be exposed to predator-based psychosocial stress. Essentially, mice are terrified of cats. So they're going to be put in a situation where they can't be physically harmed by the cat, but they will be surrounded by all the stimuli of a cat being present, and it creates great emotional distress for the mice. In order to evaluate this aim, we will use inflammatory biomarker testing. And again, it is expected that that TNF-alpha will be the most elevated biomarker in those mice who receive early life stress. Now, this allows me to go into my specific aim number two, which focuses more on cardiovascular disease and TNF-alpha. So aim two is to determine the impact of TNF-alpha elevation on susceptibility to cardiovascular disease in mice through the use of TNF-alpha blockers immediately after early life stressors. My hypothesis is that the mice who receive early life stress and these TNF-alpha blockers will be less susceptible to cardiovascular disease than the mice who receive early life stress and don't receive these TNF-alpha blockers. In order to do this, I will split my mice up into four groups for the same, half of which will receive early life stress, the other half will not, and half in each of those groups will receive a TNF-alpha inhibitor, X-Pro-1595 particularly, and the other half will receive a simple saline solution control. In order to conduct this, my third generation of mice will be born. They will go through those three same steps of early life stress, and then when the mice are 42 days old, the experimental group will receive a TNF-alpha blocker, and that will last until they are 18 weeks old, at which they will go through cardiovascular disease susceptibility testing for two weeks. In order to test for cardiovascular disease susceptibility, 
that will first look at the mice's blood pressure between weeks 18 and 20, as well as their LDL cholesterol levels. And lastly, when the mice are 20 weeks old, they'll be sacrificed, their aortas will be dissected, and we're going to do what is called atherosclerotic plaque morphometry. Essentially, that is just looking at the aorta of the, heart, the mouse heart to see if it has any of that atherosclerotic plaque buildup that I mentioned previously correlates to cardiovascular disease. So what are my expected outcomes of this study? I expect that the mice, again, who receive early life stress and these TNF alpha inhibitors will have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease than those who receive early life stress and don't receive the TNF alpha inhibitor. There are several practical impacts and future studies that are affiliated with this research. Most importantly, and truly my heart behind this study, is that we've seen that childhood trauma can impact adult health, and yet the conversation is lacking amongst healthcare providers. And so my hope is to communicate with the root of who a healthcare provider is as a scientist, and to get them to see that if we can sort of talk about the potential physiology behind how these things are happening, then maybe these clinicians would be more apt to having these more challenging, delicate conversations with their patients about their childhood trauma and their potential impacts on how it's influencing their current health state. But in addition to this, there are, of course, some other really great opportunities, including some therapeutic benefits. We see that this research could help control inflammation stemming from childhood trauma. Particularly, we're helping deepening the knowledge of TNF-alpha inhibitors as a preventative against cardiovascular disease and chronic inflammation. And of interesting note, there are two currently, there are two current FDA-approved TNF-alpha inhibitors. You may have heard of them, Humarin and Imbril. And so if someone did want to continue this research into a clinical trial for humans, then they might be a little more streamlined as we have two FDA-approved drugs for that. And lastly, this research could serve as some predictive value, because if we see that TNF-alpha is frequently elevated in patients with cardiovascular disease, then if a clinician notices that their patient has elevated levels of TNF-alpha, it might be a good indication to them that they need to be aware that my patient is at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, and that's something I should be aware of in my care of them. In the end here, I have many people I would love to acknowledge. First, Dr. Shaw, thank you so much for being consistent wisdom and guidance throughout all of this and throughout my last four years here. I'd like to thank Dr. Abraham for being our loving encourager as our capstone professor this semester, as well as CNHS and my peers who have been nonstop in their support and encouragement and love for me and all of my endeavors. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank God because ultimately this whole research is looking at how we can better love and serve our patients who have gone through really difficult things. And we're trying to provide them with a sense of hope and ultimately, it's a story of redemption, and God is the ultimate redemption story. Here are my references, and I'd love to take any questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, the drug written for like uh, That is very interesting. So that would be something that would be probably a huge factor in that, um, in the fact that it was 50% less likely to develop heart attacks, right? I'm sure that that's not a pure line of, it's just because we use a TNF-alpha inhibitor, that's why. Um, but I would be interested to see um, more in depth. I would, I'd like to go back and look at that study more clearly because it did say that compared to the topical treatments, um, compared there was topical treatments compared to the TNF-alpha inhibitors. So I feel like either way, it would have had the same opportunity to lead into those diseases you're talking about. So I wonder, if there's, my hypothesis would be that maybe there is still something deeper because there were other research uh, studies published that were talking about TNF-alpha inhibitors benefit in cardiovascular disease because it does lower this inflammation. So I feel like there's maybe something else going on there too, but that's an excellent point. What medical interventions an excellent question. So I think the first step is really just having our clinicians be aware that childhood trauma could be influencing their present adult health state. Because it seems like a lot of clinicians will have patients come in and they're trying to get to the root of the issue, but they're not even, the clinician may not be willing to acknowledge or just may not be aware enough to acknowledge that there might be something deeper stemming from all of this. And so I think clinically, 
my hope would be that we could all just be aware of this concept that it could impact. And so when a patient comes in and they acknowledge that they have this childhood trauma, maybe it's a more holistic treatment plan that includes diving into some of those issues so that they're not just subconsciously avoiding them, but their avoidance of an issue could actually be still presently affecting their health state. And so it's to allow us to communicate with them that they can't just consistently avoid maybe an issue that needs to be dived in a little deeper, whether that's through therapy or whatever else it is, but also just to be aware that this patient has childhood trauma. I need to be aware, do they have chronic systemic inflammation? Could that lead to these different diseases? It's just another indication of similar to like uh, family history. You know, this patient is at a higher risk to develop these diseases. Same if they have childhood trauma, they're at a higher risk to develop these diseases. That kind of mindset. Plus, you can see healthcare providers may be in their treatment pool with therapeutics based on that. Possible. As long as there is still, as long as there is still evidence outside of just, oh, I had childhood trauma. My, my goal here isn't to hear people say, I have childhood trauma, and me say, oh, here's another pill. That's not, that's not the, the, the goal. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So meet them with therapeutic models in that sense. Absolutely. Thank you for putting that on. Other questions? Let's uh, thank our speaker. <laughs> You're next, right? Just make sure I got the order right. And good box. All right, it is my privilege to, at the microphone, introduce our next speaker, Fabian uh, Vieira. She's graduating with a degree in biology with a concentration in medical sciences. She was born in Bolivia, but was raised in Lakeland, Florida, and has been at SCU for four years. Have you noted the theme? I think that just all of our speakers have been here four years. That's awesome. She has served as a TA, health service student worker, uh, volunteer, science peer mentor, SMBA vice president, Alpha Chi president, and did biology research. After graduating, she plans to take a enhancement life fruition year, right? And work as a medical assistant with applying to PA school in the future. Welcome. Thank you so much for the kind of introduction. Today I'll be talking about gene editing of FBN1 in male mice with Marfan syndrome. So Marfan syndrome is an autosomal dominant connective tissue disorder that affects multiple systems in the body. And it is a relatively rare condition. Marfan syndrome is due to a mutation in the FBN1 gene which codes for fibrillin, and fibrillin is the main component of the microfibrils, which gives structural support to the connective tissue. Right here, we can see that in Marfan syndrome, fibrillin is altered and oftentimes not produced in the correct amount, leading to the connective tissue to be altered and um, not have the, be weak and not have the elasticity that it needs. Fibrillin also plays an important role in TGF-beta growth factor. Therefore, in Marfan syndrome, um, TGF beta growth factor is not regulated, leading to an over, um, overgrowth of tissue. There's also multiple types of mutations that could lead to Marfan syndrome on the FBN1 gene. And the point mutation accounts for 70% of the mutations. There's also other types of mutations such as insertions and deletions. Now, the most common uh, type of symptom that affects Marfan syndrome, that role that is noticeable, is a tall and slender build, as well as these other symptoms. Now, the most common complication 
is oftentimes the cardiovascular system. And this is the most concerning due to the life-threatening complications such as dilation of the aorta, which is seen right here. This would be a normal aorta compared to an enlarged aorta. Um, this could lead to ruptures and tears in the heart. Other complications include mitral valve regurgitation, cardiomyopathy, and these could account for 90% of the death in Marfan syndrome patients. Now, another system that's affected is the sensory system, and ectopic lentils affects 60%. 50 to 80% of the patients. Another complication is retina detachment, as well as glaucoma and myopia. And this could lead, sorry, this could lead to blurriness or loss of vision. In the skeletal system, we see that scoliosis affects 60% of the Marfan syndrome patients. And chest wall deformity is another um, common complication that is observed. Now, the way that Marfan syndrome is diagnosed is through the gonadotropy, and this is done in several ways. If there's an absence of family history, then you would need um, two cardinal features, such as the aortic root dilation or ectopic lentils. And if these two um, cardinal features are absent, then you need the presence of the FBN1 mutation or a positive systemic score. And lastly, if you have an aorta root dilation Z score greater than or equal to two N atopic lenses, then this would be a diagnosis of Marfan syndrome. So this is the systemic score that is used in the gone in nosology, and it is based on these uh, common symptoms that are observed in Marfan syndrome. And a score of greater than or equal to seven would lead to a positive systemic score. The current treatments for Marfan syndrome are beta blockers and angiotensins, which are used to lower uh, blood pressure and in the long run, used to try to prevent um, aorta dilation. Other treatments involved orthopedic surgery, eye surgery, and cardiovascular surgery, and these have greatly um, expanded the lives of Marfan syndrome patients. These all treat the symptoms of Marfan syndrome, but don't treat the root of the problem. Now, there was a study that was done in China where they used face editing on human embryos and um, to try to fix a specific type of Marfan syndrome mutation. And although this does give rise to some ethical issues due to, due to the fact that it was done on uh, human embryos, it did show some potential um, on using base editing for genetic mutations. And the limitation to the study was that they only looked at the genotype once the embryos were edited and did not look at the phenotype expression. So for my study, I'm gonna base some of my study on this, but I am gonna use mice embryos instead and also look at the phenotype expression. So there's still a lot that is no, not known. There's no cure. The relationship between genotype and phenotype expression is not well understood and there's not we don't know if gene technology could solve the phenotype expressions that are observed in Marfan syndrome. So this leads me to my first aim, being to test efficiency of base editing gene therapy in correcting the C1039G male mice embryos with Marfan syndrome. My null hypothesis would be that there's no significant difference in base editing efficiency of an 89% between my study and the study that was done in China. So the reason for using this specific mice is because they already have this specific point mutation that leads to Marfan syndrome. And they show the most, some of the common manifestations such as aorta root dilation, skeletal overgrowth, and the curvature of the spine. They also show human homology and they have a short lifespan making it easier for me to observe their phenotype expression. Now, before I move on to the methodology, I'm going to quickly do an overview of what CRISPR is and what base editing is. So right here, we can see that CRISPR is composed of a Cas9 enzyme as well as a guide RNA. And the guide RNA will lead the Cas9 enzyme to the specific sequence. Well, then it will lead, it will cause a double-stranded DNA break. And this will then cause an indel in the cell, causing the cell to try to correct itself through insertions and deletions. On the other hand, we have base editing, which is composed of a ca catalytic inactive Cas9 enzyme that is fused with a DMNase enzyme and as well as a guide RNA. The guide RNA will go to the specific base and it will cause a DMNase catalytic chemical reaction. And then the cell will go through um, DNA replication and correct, correct the base. 
Now, the difference between base editing and CRISPR-Cas9 is that base editing does not cause a double-stranded DNA break. And this is significant because double-stranded DNA breaks can lead to more errors in the cells. And base editing is also more specific than CRISPR. So in my specific study, I will be doing trying to correct the guanine to an adenine. And the way in which I plan on designing my study would be by having a control group, a wild type, normal FBN1. There will be three groups, and there will be 100 embryos in each group. In the other group, there will be a wild type that will be mutant by base edited. I will have two experimental groups. One will have a mutant that will be corrected by base editing, and another experimental group that will be um, edited by CRISPR-Cas9. This is the specific environment where the embryos will be at, and we will have to partner up with Beam Therapeutic to be able to do this study. The embryos will be edited at a one cell stage embryo. For my expected outcome, I am expecting that we will observe a um, efficiency of 89% out of 100 cells using base editing. And my results would um, be able to be compared to the results found on the study that was done in China. So therefore, there is no significant difference in the base editing efficiency of 89 between my study and the study that was done. So this would lead me to my second aim, which is to determine the phenotype expression of base editing C1039G adult mice as a consequence of embryonic gene therapy for Marfan syndrome. So my null hypothesis would be that there's no significant difference in spine curvature, aorta dilation between base edited experimental adult mice and the control adult mice as a consequence of the gene therapy. I would first have to do a utero tubero embryo transfer. And so we would first have to right here expose the uterus, the um, ovary ducts. And next, you would have to, um, with a needle, puncture through the ovary ducts. Following this, you would have to use a glass capillary pipette to puncture through the uterine lumen. And lastly, you would be, be able to transfer the embryos into the uterus. Now, once the mices are born, we would have to do gene sequencing, and we will observe them in the three stages, such as the postnatal stage, the middle adolescent stage, mature, and adult, mature adult. And we will have four groups that we will be observing over this time period. We'll be observing their aorta dilation as well as the scoliosis, the curvature of the spine. For my expected outcome for um, the aorta dilation, I am expecting that the mutant will have a drastic increase in the aorta dilation, while the wild type and the base editing will have a normal aorta dilation. CRISPR would show a smaller significant increase in um, aorta dilation. This would lead me to reject my null hypothesis, meaning that there is no significant difference from aorta dilation between base edited and the experimental control. Now for my second expected, expected outcome for the curvature of the spine, I'm expecting that the mutant type will have a drastic um, increase in the curvature of the spine, while the wild type and the base edited will have a show a normal um, curvature of the spine, and CRISPR will show a smaller increase in the curvature of the spine. For my new hypothesis, it would be rejected, meaning there is a significant difference from spine curvature between base edited experimental and the control. A limitation to the study is that due to gene variation, this approach cannot solve all mutations. Therefore, it would limit the effectiveness of using base editing. A future study would be to look at other FBN1 mutations, potentially looking at FB, uh, prime editing, and also looking to understand the genotype and phenotype relationship in Marfan syndrome. And lastly, I would like to say thank God, Dr. Horton, for being my advisor, Dr. Abraham, my family and classmates, Southeastern Universities, and um, the reason for doing my topic is because um, my brothers currently have Marfan syndrome. Thank you. And oh, any questions? Questions for the yeah. 
So that's actually a good question. And the reason why I decided to use male mice is, so Marfan syndrome is not a sex-linked um, genetic disorder. It's an autosomal dominant. And mostly all the studies I looked at, they, um, they, looked, they did uh, studies on male embryos. And that's just because it's easier um, since females have hormonal um, imbalances and stuff like that. So when studying something, uh, males can be a little bit easier. But that definitely could be something to look into for the future. Dr. Horton. So based on your literature review, um, have you seen any also genetically acquired disease that has been experimentally performed in studies? Yes. And um, I saw a study that was done in Netherlands where they, um, it was the condition cystic fibrosis, and they were able to correct the mutation of cystic fibrosis and um, be able to correct it to the correct protein using base editing. Any other questions for the speaker? Thank you. Good afternoon. One second. Thank you. Good afternoon. I have the pleasure of introducing Erin Callahan. She's graduating with a degree in communication sciences and disorders. She's from Fort Myers, Florida, and has been at SCU for four years. She has served as the ACE lead tutor, president and treasurer of our Nishala, which is our National Student Speech Language Hearing Association. She's a student coordinator for the CHARGE uh, Club. She's a side peer mentor, and she was part of the honor thesis, and today you'll get to hear um, her research that she completed. Uh, she plans to pursue a graduate degree in speech language pathology. Uh, she's applied to five uh, graduate programs and accepted all five, so she gets to make that decision. Um, she, her uh, focus will be to provide speech and language services for early intervention and, and complete clinical research. So. Oh. Thank you, Professor Anavalis. My name is Erin Callahan, and the title of my presentation is From Language to Literacy, Structural Features of Acquired Languages Facilitating English Morphological Awareness. I'm a communication sciences and disorders student, and in the future, I hope to become a speech language pathologist. I'm specifically interested in evidence-based strategies for promoting language development, specifically among individuals learning English as another language. A 2019 report by the U.S. Census revealed that in the United States, 8.2% of the population speaks English at a low level of proficiency. Some of these speakers are students with language disorders, and these are the students who are served by speech language pathologists in schools and clinics throughout the United States. I believe that it is critical to find strategies that will help to serve these students, specifically by meeting their needs in both their first and second languages. And that is what has led me to the study of morphology. So to begin, we have to ask a couple questions and define some terms, specifically, what is morphology? So a morpheme is a word part, such as a prefix, suffix, or root, which holds meaning and shapes a word's form and grammatical function. One of my favorite examples of morphology is the word anti-disestablishmentarianism, which is one of the longest words in the English language. Anti-disestablishmentarianism is comprised of seven morphemes, and each individual word part contributes to the overall meaning of the word. Morphological awareness is the awareness of morphology and the ability to recognize, manipulate, and interpret the meaning of morphemes. I like to think of morphological awareness as a train. You can look at each individual word part, such as a prefix, suffix, or root, like the individual cars of a train, while you can also look at the entire word meaning as the overall train. Now, a learned language is any language learned after a first language has been acquired, such as a second or third language. 
And languages vary in many different aspects across the globe. For example, Spanish, English, and Chinese all have extremely different structures, specifically in the features of orthographic opacity, morphological fusion, and morphological synthesis. Orthographic opacity is the degree of irregularity in a language's spelling. In English, the letters P and H both make different sounds, but when put together in combination, they make a sound like the letter F. So English can be said to have a highly irregular spelling pattern or a high degree of orthographic opacity. Morphological fusion is the degree of phonetic fusion represented in a language's spelling when a morpheme is bound to a word. I like to think of morphological fusion like mixing two colors of paint. The more they are mixed, the harder it is to separate them. English has a low degree of morphological fusion, which means that in theory, it should be easier to separate English word parts um, when trying to break down English words. Morphological synthesis is the number of morphemes which can be combined to form a single word in a language. English has a low degree of synthesis, meaning that most words stand on their own. In comparison, languages like Turkish or Finnish both form sentence words by combining many word parts into one long word that contains all of the grammatical material of a single sentence. So the significance of my topic is related to the process of language learning and how that directly impacts English morphological awareness. We know that morphological awareness in other languages contributes to English morphological awareness. For example, in languages such as Spanish, in a study conducted in 2019 by De Alessio and colleagues, it was found that Spanish morphological awareness was a direct contributor to levels of English morphological awareness. And a similar effect was found in French by Nunes and colleagues in 2012. So my area of interest is to determine what factors directly contribute to the transfer of morphological awareness from a first language to English. And specifically, I wanted to see what strategies might affect that. So for my first specific aim, I wanted to investigate the impact of English literacy and English oracy upon proficiency in morphological awareness in English. English literacy proficiency involves reading and writing in English, while English oracy proficiency involves speaking and or listening to English. And I wanted to see the effects of both of those variables upon English morphological awareness. For my sp second specific aim, I wanted to investigate the impacts of three different structural features, morphological fusion, orthographic opacity, and morphological synthesis upon English morphological awareness to see um, which, if any of those features, directly impacted morphological awareness. For my third specific aim, I wanted to investigate those factors again, but in the presence of words with sound shifts or spelling shifts. So a sound shift is a change in the sound of a word that is caused by the addition of a morpheme. For example, the word act sounds like action, um, and the T changes in sound when the word part shun is added to the end. A spelling shift is similarly a change in spelling that occurs when a morpheme is added at the end of the word. For example, the E in use becomes the U in usually when the word's form is changed by the addition of a morpheme. So I sought to investigate how those three specific specific language structural features could impact awareness of sound shifts and of spelling shifts. Now, the impact for English language learners comes in the impact it has on intervention. Approaches for, for teaching English to speakers of other languages should be individualized, and that means that we have to understand the impacts of an English language learner's first language upon their knowledge of English and how that affects their ability and the way in which their brain processes English. So my methodology consisted of conducting an observational study with a non-experimental quantitative design. I created a research survey instrument that was distributed online 
and afterwards categorized the languages according to their structural features. I then completed statistical analyses, including descriptive statistics, inferential statistics, and predictive statistics to determine the presence and magnitude of a relationship between the variables. My research instrument consisted of a language history questionnaire, which involved demographic questions about the languages participants had learned, and an English morphological awareness task in which participants could select two related words out of a set of three. My participants were recruited through social media and were all over the age of 18 and possessed at least a working knowledge of English and another language. For my first specific aim, I found two statistically significant results. First, I found that there was an approximate large effect size of English literacy upon English morphological awareness. I also found that there was a medium effect size of English oracy on English morphological awareness, which means that literacy had a greater effect on English language learners in the way that they processed English. For my second specific aim, I found another statistically significant finding, and I found that approximately 11% of the variance in overall morphological awareness was explained by a combination of all three language structural features. Specifically, I found that orthographic opacity and morphological synthesis were two of the biggest factors. For my third specific aim, I found two more statistically significant findings. And specifically, I found that morphological fusion was the greatest contributor to a morphological awareness of sound shifts, while orthographic opacity and morphological synthesis were the greatest contributors to morphological awareness of spelling shifts. So what does this all mean? I had three conclusions that I drew from the results of this study. First, even though both English literacy proficiency and English oracy proficiency contribute to morphological awareness, English literacy proficiency had a greater impact. Therefore, interventions should be literacy-based and intervention programs should be centered around using texts and reading to facilitate development of English morphological awareness. Second, while all three factors contributed to English morphological awareness, they each contributed differently. Morphological synthesis and orthographic opacity contributed to awareness of, spe of spelling, while morphological fusion contributed to awareness of sound. However, out of all of the factors, morphological synthesis contributed the most to English morphological awareness. Therefore, the ability to combine and separate prefixes, suffixes, and roots has a greater impact on English morphological awareness than being able to read irregular spelling patterns. So that leads to my third conclusion. It's important to contrast the morphology of English with the morphology of an English language learner's first language, because by being able to compare and contrast the two, morphological awareness develops and the ability to break down words into their prefixes, suffixes, and roots develops. The strengths of my study were the diverse participant sample, which consisted of over 40 different participants from 39 different countries. While the limitations were the high educational attainment of participants and the fact that participants were passionate about language learning, in fact, they knew up to 11 languages, which means that they might have been slightly more interested in language learning than the average speaker of English or, in, or the average speaker of multiple languages. In the future, I'd like to complete a randomized controlled trial of programs for English language learners to investigate further the effects of morphological awareness on intervention programs. I'd like to thank God who made all of these languages that we get the opportunity to study. I'd like to thank my family for their support, Dr. Amy Braddon, my thesis advisor, and Dr. Thomas Gallery, who did the data and analytics, as well as Professor Stephanie Renovales for her love of uh, language and communication and uh, the entire School of Honors team, Dr. Gordon Miller, Mrs. Molly Owen, and Professor Amy Beattie, who supported me along the way. Here are my references. And are there any questions?
Hey, Dahlia. That's a great question. So we actually had a variety of countries, including European languages, um, languages from the uh, Asiatic origin, and then also even some languages from Africa. So most of the languages fell into the uh, Indo-European family, which means that many of the languages were either Romance languages or languages um, that were Germanic or related to English. But we also had some that were um, from uh, Asiatic origin, which is a slightly different language background. So it was very interesting to compare and contrast the differences between the two. And how do you think um, you can that's so living in the United States, like, um, mm -hmm. something more like white skill or mm -hmm. uh, being from a healthcare That's a great question. So adults actually learn languages in a little bit of a different way than young children. Children usually pick up languages from the environment around them. And so they're acquiring languages through environmental exposure. Adults typically learn languages in a more academic way. And so because of that, adult language learners and uh, ch language acquirers, children who are acquiring languages, um, pick up languages differently. And so that thus they have different types of morphological awareness. My study was specifically on adults, which means that they've probably had more classroom exposure to morphemes. And so because of that, they have most likely had a little bit more exposure to that conscious knowledge of what word parts and prefixes, suffixes, and roots are. But at the same time, uh, children are developing that around fourth grade. So it's important to begin uh, cultivating that in both languages as they're developing, specifically if a child has a language disability. Any other questions? That concludes today's session.